So our, our second talker this morning is uh, Richard Soreff, and uh, he's from the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Richard received his doctorate from Stanford in 1963 and is currently research professor of physics at UMass. And for the past 50 years, he's engaged in basic and applied research, mainly in photonics and semiconductors. In 2006, Professor Soreff received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the IEEE Group 4 Photonics Conference. He's a fellow of the IEEE, OSA, IOP, and also AFRL. So Richard's uh, title this morning is Group 4 Photonics for the Mid-Infrared. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. <clears throat> thank you, David, and uh, thank you, Alexi, for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to be here at these exciting uh, opto conferences. Um, the, the subtitle of my talk is uh, Opportunities and Challenges for a Silicon-Based Optoelectronic Mid-Infrared System on a Chip. And uh, this morning I will be covering silicon-based photonic techniques applied to the 2 to 5 micron wavelength range. This is the new frontier for Group 4. I'll talk about potential applications, system on a chip integration, uh, the various mid-infrared waveguides, monolithic silicon germanium tin integration, hybrid 3.5 integration on germanium, and I'll discuss refractometers, spectrometers, and some nonlinear optical transceivers. Uh, here's a list of the potential applications, and the primary application is really chemical, biological, and physical sensing. So sensing is the main topic. Also, there is medical diagnostics, industrial process control, high-speed infrared communications at the two micron wavelength band, environmental monitoring, active imaging and LADAR, signal processing, and infrared astronomy, which refers to uh, beam combining on a chip. I'd like to focus on one rather recent uh, application, which is ultra-fast optical communications at the two micron wavelength band. The motivation here is to increase the capacity of global networks and to reduce the energy consumption at the same time. The approach being taken in Europe is to deploy some new photonic band gap optical fibers at the two micron wavelength where low losses have recently been attained. This will, re this will result in a significant increase in the network capacity. However, we need to invent some new network node components to go along with the fibers. The project is being funded in Europe under the ModeGap project, the, funded by EU, and the Photonics Hyperhighway, funded by EPSERC. I would like to suggest to you this morning an all group four solution to this two micron communication problem. And here is the approach that I would recommend. Uh, germanium tin, multiple quantum well photo detectors, on SOI, silicon on insulator. Also, germanium tin multi-quantum laser diodes on SOI, um, SOI free carrier electro-optic modulators, or uh, germanium tin waveguide Franz Keldish field effect modulators, and then a group of uh, SOI passive components to go with these active components. So I think that the Wavelength band from uh, 1.9 to 2.1 microns is a natural wavelength for group four. And uh, I think that the group four approach has the silicon foundry advantage. The foundry advantage can then compete with the 3.5 semiconductor approach that is being taken on the European projects. So I would recommend this as a, a new project. Uh, let's talk about the benefits of a uh, system on a chip. If we look at the prior art of mid-infrared systems, particularly the low-power uh, systems, not uh, infrared countermeasures, anything like that, but 
The prior art is a, a, a group of discrete components that are wired together on a substrate. I'm suggesting to you that this system could be condensed or shrunk down to a system on a chip shown on the uh, upper right diagram. And this is a planar uh, chip that's waveguided. Uh, this, also, you could have a free space system on a chip where the waveguided chip communicates to free space optics using uh, surface relief gratings on the chip or Fano resonance devices on the chip. What are the advantages of system on a chip? Well, first of all, it sh should be manufacturable at low cost in, in a high volume foundry. There will be savings in size, weight, and power. It will be reliable. It will be rugged. Uh, and there's the, the distinct possibility of optoelectronic integration of the photonics with CMOS or bipolar transistors. Uh, what about the temperature of operation of the chip? Uh, on this diagram, I've plotted the temperature of operation versus the wavelength of operation. And in the region from two to three microns, I think there is no problem with room temperature operation. It's easy to achieve and you will get high performance. Now, uh, there is an issue as you go to the th into the three to five micron band. Uh, if you cool the chip, you certainly will get high performance. Um, high performance is a more difficult to achieve at room temperature, but you really want room temperature, so I'm suggesting that you would make some sort of compromise in the active components and that you would accept a higher threshold for the laser diodes or a lower detectivity for the photodiodes in order to achieve uh, room temperature operation. And that, in that case, you will get the room temperature chip. Uh, let's talk about integration. Um, in my 1993 paper in uh, Proceedings of the IEEE, I proposed uh, essentially one photonic layer that was um, sort of married to uh, transistor electronics around it, and there was also uh, end fire fiber coupling. So this is um, a sort of a basic one, one layer scheme. I think that now people are talking about three dimensional integration for chips. So I think that's, that's the future. That's kind of the, the ultimate answer. And uh, various people are discussing how to do this. Uh, this uh, slide comes from the uh, Cornell Nanophotonics Group. It's an artist's uh, rendering of what they uh, visualize. And I would like to uh, go into more detail. Uh, I, for three-dimensional integration, I'm going to propose to you a multi-technology chip. This is a multi-layer uh, scheme, and you're going to combine various technologies, including electronics, photonics, plasmonics, photonic crystals, and opto-electromechanical technologies. So on the drawing on the left, you see the various layers, and uh, you could have uh, one technology in each individual layer, or you could have several technologies inside of uh, one uh, one layer, and the layers need to communicate vertically with each other. The drawing on the right shows the various inputs and outputs that you could have to the chip, which include chemical, biological, physical, infrared, microwave, terahertz, RF, electronic, and DC electrical. So it's qu quite a versatile chip, and I think this is sort of the, the ultimate uh, chip that you could have. Uh, let's talk about sensors and the various uh, possible configurations uh, of a sensor. Uh, the drawing on the uh, upper left shows a LADAR or an active imager chip where the uh, transmitter portion and the receiver portion are co-located on the chip for free space coupling. The lower left shows a uh, fiber optic readout of the chip using some specialty infrared fiber. The drawing on the lower right shows wireless readout. Uh, the, the chip could have a, an RF component, uh, RF transmitter on that chip to send the readout remotely to a second uh, readout chip at a, at a remote lo location. So you could wear the chip on your sleeve and, and see it at a remote station. 
the di a diagram on the upper right is my uh, concept for a uh, disposable optoelectronic chip. And uh, so I think that you could have a new kind of uh, optical USB cable for this chip, for example, and you could connect uh, the contact sensor chip through the USB to a desktop or a handheld device and the idea of the USB is to have a glass optical fiber in the cable along with a DC electrical lead which provides electrical bias for the lasers and photodiodes. And it can be disposable uh, in the manner of the uh, Genolite Corporation. Uh, what are the possible mid-infrared waveguides uh, based on silicon, and I'm going to give you five uh, practical possibilities here. The first is uh, germanium on silicon. The second is germanium on SOI. Uh, the, the third on the uh, lower left is uh, silicon on insulator, which has low propagation loss, out to 3.6 microns. Then there's silicon on sapphire, going out to 5.6 microns and silicon on nitride going to 6.7 microns. Uh, now a group in, uh, in Switzerland, Dr. Chang, has demonstrated recently uh, experimentally the uh, germanium on silicon waveguide and he wrote two papers. The first was to show that uh, there was high transmission through the waveguide and the second paper was on a sensor and so I'll review that for you. Um, he reported cocaine detection with uh, a germanium waveguide and a microfluidic chamber. Um, he chose the wavelength of 5.7 microns using a room temperature quantum cascade laser source and the wavelength of operation was I think a characteristic absorption wavelength for the cocaine molecules. The uh, cocaine molecules acted as a absorbing cladding upon the germanium and then uh, when the molecules were present, the transmission of the germanium channel went down, and he, that's how he observed uh, the molecules. Um, there are a lot of relevant mid-infrared materials that, um, unfortunately, I won't have time to cover this morning, but I thought I would just make a list for you. Uh, the first would be graphene. There's also silicene. Germanine, diamond, uh, calcogenide glass, plasmonic materials, and several more. So it's, it's a large list. Um, how are we going to create the new chips? Uh, well, I think first we need to invent some new mid-infrared active devices, either monolithic or hybrid integrated, using group four materials and three five semiconductor materials. Uh, we can take we can modify and scale up the dimensions of 1.55 micron uh, telecom photonic circuits for operation in the 2 to 5 micron band, and we may require some new physics knowledge in the process. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the types of integration for the chip, and the first uh, type is monolithic integration. In a, in a silicon foundry. And uh, the idea here is uh, to make a complete suite of active and passive components, all of them made using group four heterostructures, uh, used drawing upon silicon, germanium, silicon, germanium, tin alloys, and silicon, germanium, carbon. And uh, people have been working vigorously on this in the last uh, three or four years some results with epitaxy, and I'd like to just give you two examples. Um, the first comes from the University of Ghent, Belgium. Uh, Gunther Rolkens is the group leader there, and uh, he made um, a germanium tin photo detector with germanium barriers. This is a dilute germanium tin alloy. Uh, it's a, it has several quantum wells, and he shows the responsivity from one micron to 2.5 microns using, for example, three quantum wells, and he gets a pretty good result. And I would suggest that if he had five or six quantum wells, he'd get a very competitive uh, responsivity for his photodiodes. Uh, the next example is a, a design that my colleague uh, Greg Sun and I 
came up with for a room temperature mid-infrared uh, germanium tin PIN multi-quantum well laser diode on a silicon substrate uh, using a relaxed germanium tin buffer layer as, as a virtual substrate. And uh, we showed in our uh, Optics Express paper that uh, the Auger recombination was low and the laser threshold was reasonable at wavelengths ranging from about 1.9 to 2.5 microns. So I think somebody should really go out and, and build this device. Um, what about modulation? Well, I think uh, the free carrier plasma effect using electrons and holes is quite valid at the mid-wave and long-wave infrared. And my colleague, colleagues in England and I have written about this. And uh, we plot, this is a theoretical analysis, we plotted the change in the real index of crystal silicon and the change in the imaginary index or the absorption coefficient as a function of wavelength from 2 to 14 microns for various carrier concentrations. So the effect increases with increasing wavelength, and it's a rather strong effect. Also, we are in the process of studying free carriers in germanium, and germanium is going to have an even stronger effect than this. Uh, now, this uh, type of modulator has been realized recently by the IBM group, and uh, they made a, a Mach Zender modulator. A cross section is shown in the lower right, and it operated at a wavelength of 2.17 microns. So this is one of the first uh, free carrier demonstrations in the mid infrared. Uh, now, a very practical uh, alternative approach is hybrid integration or heterogeneous integration. So. Let's use three five semiconductor devices that we know about and put them on silicon. Three approaches. The first is to bond the three five with a thin film to the silicon or germanium waveguide using evanescent wave coupling. The second is to bond the three five die inside of a trench for end fire coupling into the silicon or germanium waveguide. The third approach is epitaxy, where we need lattice matching to the silicon or germanium. However, uh, you need a buffer layer or one or two buffer layers, and the lattice parameter has to be something like 5.9 angstrom in order to match the lattice of the 3.5. So actually, the, the burden of proof is on the buffer layer because we need to develop uh, silicon germanium tin alloys, alloys with a large fraction of tin. This is a, a growth problem. It, it, people need to work on that as well. So these are the approaches for hybrid integration. And there are some examples of what has been done. Again, the uh, University of Ghent and IMEC in Belgium has developed a manufacturing method for heterogeneous integration of three fives on silicon photonic integrated circuits. They use an adhesive bonding layer of BCB polymer, and they have developed this uh, process to, to do it. I, I'm not going to detail it, but just to tell you that they have, the process exists. Um, as far as laser sources, three five semiconductors uh, on silicon or germanium, I would recommend uh, either the quantum cascade laser uh, or the type 2 interband uh, cascade laser. Uh, and these are room temperature uh, devices for the mid-infrared. And um, in order to achieve this, I think you could take a commercial chip from one of the suppliers. And if you thin the bottom contact, and let's say it's an NIN diode, you'd thin the N region. And this would allow evanescent coupling um, um, out of the, the bottom of the cascade laser into the, into the germanium waveguide. So I think this is a good approach. And um, there are some examples of what has been done on hybrid integration. This comes from, again, uh, Ghent and IMEC, and this is a gallium indium arsenide antimonide PIN photodetector, which has been hybrid integration, integrated on an SOI waveguide. Uh, this shows the um, photographs of the actual device and the schematic, and um, the results um, are, are rather good. Um, 
It's in the 2.0 to 2.5 micron wavelength range. Uh, Ghent has also integrated an array of gallium antimonide photodiodes on a silicon spectrometer. This shows the top view of the device, so I think this is an impressive um, hybrid integration. Uh, let's talk about um, de detection of trace amounts of gases, uh, and let's look at some mid-infrared absorption spectra of, uh, of common gases. We see that there's some prominent absorption uh, lines for these well-known gases at uh, mid-infrared, and this provides the motivation relief really for the mid-infrared in the sense that the fundamental vibrations of the gases occur in this region. That's why we want to focus on the mid-infrared. Uh, but let's, if we go to the idea of trace amounts of gases, there is a challenge, the trace gas challenge. It's difficult. W what we want to do is to uh, detect traces on a chip without using a free space gas concentrator. So we have to apply some sensitive and clever techniques to, de to sense uh, methane or carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide or nitrous oxide. Also, there is a need for a breathalyzer to analyze uh, exhaled breath. For example, in the medical world, two breathalyzer applications are uh, detection of glu glucose for diabetic people or to detect the alkalinity of your uh, exhaled breath for as people suffering from asthma. And generally, we want to detect parts per million of the trace gas or even parts per billion. So this is not easy. Um, and uh, I would like to discuss one uh, approach for doing this, which is a refractometer. So I'd like to, this is just a proposal for how you might do it. I encourage you to, to try this. Uh, this, what I'm suggesting here, is a trace gas refractometer in a high Q germanium nanobeam. So we start with a, a strip waveguide of germanium on silicon and we form the one-dimensional photonic crystal cavity or resonator. Then there's an on-chip laser diode which is emitting at the characteristic absorption wavelength of the gas and we also have an on-chip photodiode to measure the transmitted intensity through the nanobeam and that the molecules to be analyzed um, act as a cladding upon the germanium waveguide. They can infiltrate the, the holes that you have etched or you can even have a slot in there. And the presence of the ref new refraction will shift the resonant uh, wavelength of the, of the photonic crystal cavity. So the next question is, how are we going to measure the, the wavelength shift? Uh, a group at uh, Rice University has proposed a clever technique, which I would like to suggest here. It's electro-optic sine wave modulation of the cavity. So I'm suggesting a, um, P, a PN junction in the cavity region, so P-doped and N-doped germanium with contacts uh, to use carrier depletion in the cavity region. This would shift, so the EO modulation would shift that resonance. And uh, what the group at Rice found was that they could use an audio frequency modulation at 10 kilohertz, which was, would dither the cavity mode. And they took the ratio of the second harmonic at 20 kilohertz um, to, the to the 10 kilohertz modulation, and they plotted that ratio as shown by the red spike in the upper left drawing, and you get a very accurate uh, location for the resonance. And in fact, they were able to determine the resonance wavelength to within 0 0.16 picometers. So this is a very sensitive way of knowing where the resonance is, and this will enhance the sensitivity of this refractometer. 
Um, now, and I, I'm coming to the end of my talk, and um, I have a group of slides that, and which refer to a spectrometer on a chip. So I want to uh, propose three uh, new designs for a spectrometer on a chip in the hope that you will investigate them and see what, see what can be done. And um, the first one refers to a broadband source that's on the chip, and um, this is really going to be thermal emission. So, uh, as shown on the left, the people in um, the Ukraine, the Malyutenko has shown that if a germanium plate is heated to 380 Kelvin uh, and it's optically pumped, that uh, there is efficient down conversion of the pump light into uh, broadband thermal emission. And this diagram on the right shows the emission spectrum from 3 to 16 microns as a function of pump power. So this is indeed a broadband source for a spectrometer on a chip. And so I'm suggesting that um, you could make an on-chip FTIR absorption spectrometer using a germanium black body source. And uh, on the upper left, I show that you would have a microstrip uh, resistance heater at the input to a germanium waveguide on silicon and a 1.55 micron pump. That pump would uh, be converted then to uh, thermal emission traveling through the waveguide. So uh, let's look at the top view of this proposed chip. Uh, the pump laser comes in and excites the um, thermal emission. Then I would have a three to five micron uh, band uh, pre-filter as shown there. And then the filtered light would go into an analysis channel where you might have a serpentine a coiled or serpentine waveguide, you might have a slot in the waveguide, and the analyte uh, molecules would be in that channel. And that those molecules would um, modify or impress their spectrum on the black body spectrum. Then the modified uh, black body spectrum would be sent to an FTIR portion, a discrete FTIR. Uh, this has been discussed by the people in Ottawa at uh, National Research Council. It's a series of unbalanced Mach Zender interferometers. I've shown four out of perhaps 32 Mach Zenders, and uh, they give you spatial heterodynes, and they give you the Fourier transform of the spectrum. Uh, then you'd have on-chip photodiode and computer to deconvolve the spectrum and give you the actual molecular spectrum readout. So it's an FTIR with no, no moving parts. Uh, Nonlinear optics can also help in spectroscopy, and I'll give you a couple of examples. And um, uh, I'm co-author of a review on the third-order nonlinearities of silicon, silicon germanium alloy, and germanium. And uh, all three materials have very high third-order susceptibility, which can be used in the mid-infrared for um, four-wave mixing. And uh, germanium has not really been exploited yet. It's the strongest of the three, so I suggest that there's a role to play in the future for germanium. But uh, in fact, uh, germanium is the new silicon, I think. But anyhow, so uh, here is a proposal for an on-chip spectrometer using a nonlinear optical frequency comb source, and you would have a pump laser going into a silicon or germanium waveguide which is then coupled to a micro ring resonator. And the resonator would be resonant at three frequencies, the pump, the signal, and the idler for four-wave mixing. And by cascaded four-wave mixing, you would get a frequency comb coming out of the micro ring, which is centered at the pump wavelength. That uh, frequency comb, which is like a series of spectral spikes, so those spectral Spikes are sent into the analysis chamber, and the, spike, the uh, spikes are attenuated by the molecular spectrum. So you get a modified comb. The modified comb is then sent to a very fast infrared photodiode, and we also tap off a portion of the single frequency pump and send it to the same photodiode for mixing. So you get a different frequency mixing, or you might call them beat, beat notes or beat signals. And the beat signals 
uh, are at the, in the microwave range due to the microwave spacing of the spikes in the comb. And then a microwave spectrum analyzer will allow you to reconstruct the molecular spectrum. Now, um, a group at, uh, groups at uh, IBM, Columbia University, and Ghent uh, have proposed in Nature Photonics a uh, mid-infrared transceiver or a sensor using the third order nonlinearity in uh, silicon waveguides. So there's one SOI chip, and it contains two uh, coiled up silicon waveguides. These are silicon spirals, and um, they're approximately, I think, one centimeter long in each coil. And um, there is a transmitter portion and a receiver portion on the same chip, and there's one pumping laser diode located on the chip, and that pump uh, simultaneously pumps the transmitter and the receiver silicons, as shown. So on the left, and, and by the way, we're going to use um, four-wave mixing in the silicon with phase matching and uh, dispersion-engineered uh, waveguides. Then um, a, on the left side, a telecom laser diode is mixed with a pump laser diode. To uh, get down conversion, you get a mid-infrared signal generation, which is sent over a specialty fiber to a remote location for communications or for analyzing, for sensing something at the remote location. Then uh, the weak mid-infrared return signal comes back over a second fiber to the receiver portion. And now the mid-infrared is mixed with a pump, and you get frequency up conversion, and that up conversion is sent to an on-chip telecom photodiode to, to detect the mid-infrared. And so the beauty of this chip is that you have basically only telecom components on the chip to perform a mid-infrared mission. So this is very clever, and I think it really, it really should be investigated. And that uh, brings me to my uh, conclusion, which is that I've shown you some excellent possibilities, but uh, of course, there are also grand challenges associated with it. And I think that this topic is very much alive as evidenced by uh, many papers being uh, presented this week at uh, these opto conferences. And uh, I would like to uh, thank the Air Force Office of Scientific Research for their ongoing support of my work. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. We have time for one or two questions. I was going to ask you myself, if I may, um, yes. with regard to the sensing, your molecular sensing, yes. you need a very, uh, 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 you need to keep the surface of that very clean, and the, the process of absorption on the surface needs to be reversible every time, I guess. Is that a problem? Or? Well, there's a whole, um, I'm not an expert on biology, but uh, I talked with Ray Chen of Texas about proteins that, uh, there are things that grab the proteins, the conjugate of the thing you're looking for. There's a whole, uh, folklore or procedures of uh, surface preparation, uh, depending on whether you're looking at DNA or uh, toxic um, gases. So uh, the, I think the short answer is I, do, I don't know specifically what these surfaces are, but there are surface preparation techniques that may be critical to the sensor operation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Another question anywhere? It's very hard to see up here with these, these lights streaming ahead. Oh, yeah, there's one there, yeah. There may be a microphone, I think, if you want to come to, come down. About the application, you talk about the future telecommunications to go up to the two microns, yes. up to two microns. Just uh, have you make any estimation uh, about uh, how much improve you're going to have in bandwidth, mainly the cost of trying to change all the systems that you already have 
for 150 uh, 50 to the new wavelength range? I mean, you're thinking about an application in how long term to, to be? Have I made any estimation of the bandwidth? I didn't hear the question of the bandwidth. Yeah, what I just only want to check with you is uh, having in mind which is the increment in bandwidth that you can, that you can have if you go to longer wavelengths. Uh, no, I, uh, the, the answer is no, I have not made de detailed calculations, but I th uh, the increase in wavelength from 1550 to 2000 is not large, and I think um, there may be a slight sacrifice in the speed of the components as you go to the longer wavelengths, but I think it will not be a significant sacrifice. I think that the group four components will be able to have operation speeds that, ma that match those uh, that exist at telecom. Okay. So I think that it, there will be a fairly smooth transition. I think there will be no showstoppers or fundamental uh, limits that will seriously degrade the bandwidth at two microns. Am I, am I answering? Um? Yeah, yeah, which is only to, to, to be sure that, uh, I mean, uh, the improvement that you, you have is really worthy enough uh, thinking, having in mind all the cost that it will mean just to change all the current technology that you are using now? The, the improvement has, and the doing, has to do with cost, did you say? Yeah. Yes, uh, yes I think that uh, the found, um, found, man, foundry manufacture is a, a key element in, um, in the commercialization of these components, and I think that that's a, a, a basic advantage of group four in silicon is the, is the foundry uh, versus indium phosphide mm -hmm. or, or hybrid integration. Uh, so I think the, there will be cost savings. Okay, thank you. Is there one more question? Yeah, this uh, gentleman. Oops. Oh. Ah, okay. okay. You didn't mention the use of doped semiconductors for plasmonics or to substitute metals in the foundry processes. Doped semiconductors, doped, uh, very doped. highly doped. Yes, uh, there, uh, there is a thing uh, that I've written about called group four plasmonics. So uh, yes, of course you can use metals for your plas you can make uh, hybrid waveguides which combine the plasmonic waveguiding with photonic waveguiding. Combination of metal con SPP confinement and dielectric. Uh, you can use metals, but not all metals are CMOS compatible. So there is doped silicon. 10 to the 20, 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 21 doping of silicon is, has enough electron density for plasmonics. So doped silicon or doped germanium are plasmonic conductors. Also there are silicides, uh, platinum, cobalt, uh, so forth, silicide, there's even germanicides. So there is such a thing as group four uh, plasmonics, which needs to be exploited, and the mid-infrared is where you get the crossover to, uh, of the plasma frequencies. So uh, it is natural, it is useful at, in this domain. I don't know, am I answering? So you didn't mention for lack of time, not because- I didn't you, mention what? You did not mention this opportunity because no, you did not- No, I did have not, uh, and certainly uh, plasmonics, have, there's a history of plasmonics. I didn't mention it, it, I didn't have time, but it's, a, it's important uh, in sense, there is such a thing as plasmonic AT, uh, ATR sensors, which are very sensitive, so uh, there is a big opportunity for uh, group four plasmonics in, this, in these applications, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's take the opportunity to thank Professor Sorif once again. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>